Whether you're looking for a convenient refresher course, or a way to earn your Pragmatic certification at your own speed, or the chance to take a Pragmatic course from your specific corner of the world, then Foundations On Demand is the solution you need. Get the same great content, tools, and templates our Foundations course is famous for in a flexible and easy-to-use online learning platform. Learn the skills you need to build and market products people want to buy. And earn your Pragmatic Institute certification anywhere, anytime. No more travel worries, no more time zone issues, just truly great training. Experience the new way of training with Foundations On Demand from Pragmatic Institute. Visit pragmaticinstitute.com slash foundations to learn more. And welcome to the Pragmatic Product Chat series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product management, product marketing, and other market and data-driven professionals with some of the best minds in the industry. I am Rebecca Caligaris, Vice President of Marketing and Product Strategy at Pragmatic Institute, and your host for this episode. Today, we are going to talk about, if you listen to this, you know it's one of my favorite topics. We're going to talk about win-loss and the power of win-loss. And today to help us do that, we've got Will Young and Zach Golden from Anova Consulting. And we're going to talk about how do you create a program that aligns to your strategic initiatives? And then how do you go beyond that data, right? How do you really make an impact with those programs? So lots of good examples, lots of good stories, lots of good insights. Welcome, Will and Zach. Yeah. Thanks, Rebecca. We're really excited to be here. Yeah, All right. First... Oh, sorry. First, for our listeners, give us a little bit of background on, on you guys and on ANOVA. Sure. So, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just start by introducing ANOVA. So, you know, ANOVA, we're a market-leading win-loss analysis firm. So we provide other voice to the customer services, but really the way in which we partner with most of our clients is through a win-loss program. And, and how we approach our programs is we combine really awesome technology with high-touch professional services and consulting to ensure that our client programs run effectively and we're able to deliver insights back to our clients that are tailored to their business and actionable so that they can compete more effectively and ultimately win more business. So I've been at Anova nine years now and in my current role as Director of Client Management, I oversee programs that we run for our clients and ensure that we are providing those tailored actionable insights back to them. So really excited to be talking with you today you know, obviously by doing this kind of work for, for so long, I think win-loss is an awesome tool for companies to get better and really thrilled to share some of those best practices and examples so that hopefully your listeners can use them to help them run their own best-in-class programs. Perfect. And Thanks, Zach. I'm, and Will? Yeah, and I'm Will. I'm a senior research analyst here at Nova. I've been here for about a year and a half now, and my responsibilities really fall into two buckets. The first is program management, so on a day-to-day -day basis, making sure we're getting the data and information we need from our clients to ensure we're getting the interviews done, returning individual interview transcripts as they get completed, and kind of monitoring our dashboard, making sure it's populated with the most recent analytics. But then the second bucket, and where a lot of my responsibility falls, is more on the back end of the program and what we call the reporting and analytical phase, where we're kind of pulling together the data set of all the interviews identifying common themes and, and ultimately pulling together a report uh, filled with actionable insights and recommendations based on our clients' customers' perceptions that we're reading out to an executive level audience. And that second bucket really is my favorite part of the job. It's incredibly <laughs> rewarding to be sitting in the room with C-suite level individuals and kind of telling them what their customers think of them and what they can do to change and, and win more business. And I've had the opportunity to do it across a wide range of verticals. Um, Anova does a lot of work with big B2B tech companies, financial services companies. We do work in healthcare. Being able to do that work across a wide range of verticals has, has also allowed me to identify some common themes across programs as well, write some thought leadership that I've actually had the great opportunity to post on your website. And I'm sure we'll dive into that in a little bit here. Yeah, we've had some great pieces. All right. So we are in good hands for this conversation. One of the things that, that we all touched on, and, and again, everyone who listens to this knows, win-loss is powerful. But I also think one of the things we forget is that not all win-loss programs are the same, and they're not all trying to accomplish the same thing. And I think that that's really important to understand. So talk me through a little bit about how, how you help 
clients build the right program, right? Know where to focus their win loss. Yeah, it's, it's a great point, Rebecca. When we think about win loss programs and the companies that we see get the most value out of the programs, they really put in the work up front to make sure that the win loss program is really aligned to their organization's strategic initiatives. And that's why we think that the upfront portion of a program, what at Innova we call the kickoff or the design phase, is so important. That's where we can really interface with stakeholders from an organization and identify what their strategic initiatives are. And, you know, I think it's really important to bring together stakeholders from across the business, you know, product and sales and marketing and, and you know, business line leaders, certainly customer success or services to hear what's important to all of those different stakeholders so that you can design a program that's going to uncover the information that's most important to them. You're exactly right. Win-loss, it's going to collect a lot of different feedback across a lot of different areas. And collecting feedback and data is great. But if you're able to tailor that data and that feedback to the levers of your business that are going to be most important and where you think the competitive lines are being drawn in your industry, that's how we're, you can really unlock some really great value for the program. How do you make sure that they are finding the right levers, right? That they're good hypothesis to test and not just, you know, not reinforcing their own opinions, right? When you're, when you're kind of figuring out which areas to focus on. That's why we really recommend that, that kickoff meeting with a number of different stakeholders so that they can start talking and really kind of reach internal alignment on what the, the most important things are. You know, obviously the, the head of product is, is going to be focused on product feedback and sales on sales you know, and so forth. But when they come together and really understand and, and talk amongst each other about how the different areas of the business play together, it, it really kind of bubbles up to the surface through that conversation and stronger internal alignment where you want to focus the program on. And then once you know the, the big areas that you want to focus the feedback collection on, then kind of the art becomes, okay, well, how do you collect that feedback across those different areas? And that's where we think that we have a couple of really cool best practices to talk through so that organizations can you know, take their win-loss programs to the next level. Yeah, those, those, those kickoff meetings really are crucial for us to get an understanding of what their strategic initiatives are and what they truly want to get out of the program. And kind of after that kickoff discussion, when we, we get all that knowledge, we, from there, we move into more of our what we call design phase. We're actually creating the guides and tailoring them to address those specific strategic initiatives that we uncovered in those meetings. Um, and within our guides, we use a wide range of, of types of questions. You know, we do, we have both quantitative and qualitative questions in all of our guides. Then on top of that, within the qualitative questions, we ask both leading and open-ended questions. And it really just depends on the client and what they're trying to get out of the program, wh which questions we're going to use and where. I kind of alluded earlier to some, some thought leadership I posted on your website. One of those articles was about uh, identifying your key differentiators in a marketplace and that's a kind of great example of an area where you can use a bunch of different types of questions, depending on what you're looking to get out of the program. For example, we have a B2B tech company. They do enterprise content management software. And in those kickoff meetings, we were, we were talking about differentiators and, and trying to understand what they thought their differentiators were in the marketplace. And as Zach said, we have a lot of different people from the organization in those conversations. Uh, and what we kind of picked up was that they weren't certainly, they weren't really clearly aligned of what mm. their differentiator were, was. All of them kind of had different opinions on it. And from that conversation and from learning that, we realized that we should ask more of an open-ended question when it came to differentiators, rather than trying to lead the witness and ask about a specific one. And when we did that, we asked like a very broad, you know, what, what do you see as this client's differentiators in this marketplace? And our client's kind of unique approach to document management, as well as their high touch white glove service came through as the top two things. I think it was like a 40 or 50 interview program. And all of them mentioned at least one of the two mm. um, and leaving it open ended really allowed our client to feel confident that those are were what those two things were what were coming through as their key differentiators in the marketplace. Really the only way to, to stop that sort of infighting is too strong a word, but like if, um, if we all know the business really well and all three of us could have a different point of view on what our differentiators were, but honestly, none of our opinion matters. Right. And when you, and, but, yeah. but you're pretty, you know, you feel really confident from your point uh -huh. of view. So, so there's nothing better than 40 to 50 interviews with the market to be like, Oh, well, that's the answer. Right? Exactly. But, but there are opportunities as well or, or situations where 
we have those kickoff meetings and, and the team is aligned on what they think the differentiator is. And that, that might lead us to ask a more pointed kind of leaded question. And I, I know Zach's had some clients where, where that's been the case. So he can kind of talk through an example there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, the, the open-ended questions like Will was talking about, those are great for determining what the marketplace thinks about your business. But sometimes you want to use more direct questioning to gather specific feedback, like for instance, to confirm if differentiators are resonating with your customers. You know, an example of that is we work with a, a financial services company who really specializes on part of their business on partnering with public sector clients. And they wanted to know amongst their client base if that different focus was resonating with their client decision makers and if it was important or not. And so as we have been doing the, the program over a few years with this client, we've been asking that pointed question, does you know this organization's focus on partnering with public sector organizations resonate with you? Is it important in your decision to partner with them? And Basically, by, by finding that out, by asking the pointed question, we were able to determine that it does matter. The marketplace viewed it as a key strength for our client and also a differentiator for their organization. And now because they really know that and they know that all of their hard work towards establishing their brand messaging, that that has worked, it really allowed the leadership team to focus on other areas of the business and invest more confidently in doing things like further developing their technology platform and providing more support resources to their clients because they know with such high confidence that the brand is strong. And they were able to get to that place of really confident decision-making because we were able to tailor the output of the program to answer the key questions that the client was unsure about. And so, you know, just another great example of you can ask a number of different questions within a win-loss program to collect a, a bunch of different feedback. You know, there are multiple ways to approach when loss, it isn't one size fits all. And that just means that it's all the more critical to tailor the program and the questions you asked to be as specific as possible. When you think about the tailoring, we talk a little bit about the topics and you talked a little bit about the type of questions, right? The topic might be the same, but whether we know or we're validating or we're sizing, right? You'd get kind of different questions on there. What other things do you really take into account when you're tailoring the program? We really want to think about kind of the end goal in mind. You know, we want to ultimately at the end of the program, be able to provide insights to our clients that they can use to win and retain more business moving forward. And so, you know, I think kind of given what, what I was just saying, you know, win loss isn't just about collecting data mm -hmm. and it's not just about analyzing that, that data once you collect it. You really want to be careful to think of what are the key pieces of information that we can use to, to win more business moving forward and how are we going to get there. And, and that's why at Anova we really talk a lot with our clients about trying to go beyond the data to really unlock some, some really valuable insights that are really actionable to their business. If you go on our website, front and center, going beyond the data, so basically our slogan at this point. So. I bet you guys have validated that that's what really matters. <laughs> so in creating it, we're, we are tailoring it to their strategies. We're tailoring it to where they are. We're also thinking about the outcomes, not mm -hmm. in order to sort of, you're not, look, the program isn't designed to get the answer they wanted as in like, I think it should be blue. The answer comes out at the end blue, but to make mm -hmm. sure that they get guidance and information and actionable insights in the areas that they think they need. And then, and then to get to Will's favorite part is right. Like it's the, it's the, how do I turn that data into action? How do I not just get the black and white, but kind of interpret it and go through. So let's dig a little bit into that. Yeah, absolutely. When we talk with our clients about how to go beyond the data, we really recommend three key ways in which they do that. So the first is thoroughly analyzing the data to uncover truths and then build out a story that's going to resonate with stakeholders. The second is, and it's more of a caution, but we, we really want to, you know, don't rely solely on static reports or dashboards. And we'll dip, dive into that a little bit more, but you want to broaden the conversation beyond just numbers on a page or on a screen. And that's why the third way that we recommend organizations go beyond the data is by bringing together cross-functional groups, not only at the beginning of a program to discuss what's important, but at the end of the program to discuss the findings and what to actually do about them. Yeah. 
I was just gonna say, I, I can jump in and talk about that first one there. Cause that's, as I mentioned, a big part of my job is, you know, going through and thoroughly analyzing that data to uncover and build a story. And we have a lot of different strategies that I'll walk through in this step of the, the program. And the first one I mentioned briefly earlier, but it's kind of what we call coding and, and categorizing answers to, to specific questions into common themes and just seeing how frequently they can they come up across the interviews in total. The second big one we do is we compare both the qualitative and quantitative answers. So, you know, something in pretty much all of our programs, something we ask is what are some top of mind strengths for this client? And if something is coming up top of mind as a strength a lot, and it's also something we specifically ask the prospect to rank on a scale quantitatively, and they're getting high scores there, it kind of further accentuates how, how that's a strength and is really coming through as a strength to the prospect. Um, Does it ever happen where those aren't the same? What is that? What does that signal? Yeah. That's fascinating. <laughs> that, that certainly happens as well and, and leads to a more complicated story and a little more work on our end. But you know, that that's a great point. Something might be coming up as a top of mind strength, but then when you look at the quantitative scores, it's not necessarily as much of a strength as you once thought. And there might be something else that's coming up a little less in the open end of feedback, but they're getting higher scores on the quantitative rankings. And that might be a bigger strength and something we emphasize more in the report because it's aligning more between the two different types of questions. So I suppose great. sometimes you'd be inclined in an open-ended question to to say things that make you sound, sounds terrible, but like, I'm super strategic. This is the big picture answer, right? But then when you're actually ranking, it's like, oh gosh, you know, the fact that it helps me do this thing on a regular basis is actually more important. So I think that the two is a, is a really interesting way to look at it. Yeah, no, and, and that's something we do every program is, is, and that's part of the reason why we include both of those types of questions is so we can kind of compare and contrast and, and build out a story on the back end. But a third strategy we use and something we do in all of our reporting and analytics is segmentation. So you can do cuts of the data set across a wide variety of demographics. You know, we can do it by revenue, geography. We even do cuts by specific sales leaders who was involved. Opportunities are kind of endless there. But just looking at the data set in a bunch of different ways can really uncover a lot of different stories and kind of tell a different story than what the, the big data set is saying. So that's a really important strategy. We do benchmarking as well. So Innova does work with a lot of different clients um, across a wide range of verticals, as I said. So we're able to not only show you your results in an absolute basis, but also in a relative basis. We can compare those scores that you're getting quantitatively. We can compare how frequently certain categories are coming up as an open, open-ended open top of mind strength to other clients that we've done work for um, and kind of help you better understand what's going on. And in terms of like storytelling, the benchmarking data can really help out there. For example, we had a client who on the topic of top of mind strength stuff in that question, uh, the sales team was coming through as a strength, like 70% of the time, or maybe like 65% of the time. And it really wasn't coming through as an area for improvement. So when you look at that, just on an absolute basis, it seemed like the sales team was doing really well. And they were, they got a lot of praise. But when we actually compared it to the benchmark mm. in that industry um, and of similar clients, the average was closer to like 80 or 85%. So it went from a story of your sales team is doing well, there's nothing you really need to improve to actually your sales team is doing good, but there is an opportunity to, to improve and get better and, and be compared to those best in class providers. And that's something we may not have been able to uncover without that benchmarking data. It's a great point too, right? Comparing yourself against other parts of yourself gives you one answer, but that's not the mm -hmm. same as comparing yourself exactly. to the standards and the, and the rest of the industry. Exactly. And that's not to say we don't have stories where sales team is not coming up at all and you have to go from bad to good. We certainly <laughs> have those as well. The, the benchmarking data really can help uncover more stories. And then the last one I kind of want to touch on really briefly is uh, year over year data is really important as mm -hmm. well. So a lot of our clients have ongoing programs. So, so we're pulling together these reports like on, on a yearly basis. And that can really uncover some interesting stuff because, you know, one year something might be coming through as an area for improvement or as a weakness. And that might be something we focus our report on and focus our recommendations on to help win, win more business. And the next year we can actually track to see if that, if they've made those changes and if those changes are, are, being seen and, and appreciated by their prospects. We can compare how often something's coming up as an area for improvement one year to the next. And if it's dropping. And whether your improvements working. improved it, right? Yeah. I mean, are we going in the right direction? Did what we exactly. think? Yeah. 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 So. With, with that level of analysis and wanting to be able to do segmentation by different aspects, like what volume is required in order to, to have enough 
information to, to really be able to do that kind of analysis? Yeah, that's a great question and one we get from our clients often, but it's definitely dependent on, I don't think there's one answer to that. I think it's dependent on the client. You know, if they had 30 opportunities, 30 sales opportunities this year, and we're interviewing 25 of them, I think that's like a pretty complete data set and we can segment if it's like not broken up, if whatever demographic we're focusing on isn't broken up too much and there's like two or three main things, then I think that's a big enough data set for it. I mean, we do have programs where where we're doing like 10 or 15 interviews, and those are certainly harder to do segmentations for just because the data set's way smaller. But I don't think you need you need too many interviews for the segmentation to be meaningful. Zach, so I don't, more I don't of know a, if you agree or disagree on that one. A man of the deals than a, a set number. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's really what we recommend to organizations and something your listeners should keep in mind is there, as Will said, there isn't one you know, math textbook significantly uh, or statistically significant number out there. It's really when you look at the number of data points, are you and are the are your company stakeholders going to feel confident that the numbers are representative for the business? If it's a very low volume organization, then yeah, you don't need to do that many interviews. If you have thousands or tens of thousands of deals in a year, you probably want to have a, a larger scale program so that you can do that valuable segmentation to understand maybe how trends are different across your different geos or your different deal sizes or sales teams. Excellent. And one more before we move on to, to the other parts of kind of going beyond on the segmentation, because I always think that, that that gives some really interesting information. And when we know we have, it can both help identify more powerful or more mm, important or potential segments to go after, but also tell a very different story. Do you have any great examples of some segmentation revelations <laughs> that you yes. had from your customers? Yes, we we certainly do. I can jump in there. So recently, we actually pulled together a report for kind of leading investment bank that we do work for. And I kind of mentioned earlier, so you can segment on a lot of different kinds of demographics, you know, revenue, geography, and often that data is provided from our client. But we also have the opportunity to take what's coming through in the open-ended kind of qualitative feedback within our own interviews and create our own segmentations. So what we did for this investment bank is we went through each individual transcript and kind of identified which opportunities were competitive opportunities where like other banks were being considered to be the advisor for this company that was selling and kind of did a split looking at competitive opportunities versus non-competitive opportunities. Before we did the segmentation as a whole, client service came through as a, as a reason for doing work with this client around like 15 or 20% of the time, which was like somewhat interesting. But when we did that cut for competitive versus non-competitive opportunities, we saw that almost all of the competitive opportunities were mentioning that client service as a reason, like the high touch glove, mm. high white glove service as a reason for doing work with this bank, whereas the non-competitive ones weren't bringing it up at all. We were able to go back to our client and kind of, you know, let them know when they're when they're in a competitive bid, they need to like emphasize their their high touch service as a reason for doing business with them. Whereas when they're the only ones being considered, they can kind of focus on other strengths such as their like deep expertise and, and things like that. Nice. All right. So that is what we mean by thorough analysis. Mm -hmm. exactly. Outstanding. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then that analysis, you're not going to do it justice if you just give someone a chart. So let's talk about that. Yeah, exactly. That's one of the, the biggest maybe challenges or concerns that we see with organizations trying to you know put win, a win-loss program in place is that they're really trying to rely on simple data that they can get from a dashboard or some sort of static report. And that's kind of dangerous for a number of reasons. You know, the first is that dashboards can't really filter out nonsense or noise that's in the data. The second is that Oftentimes, they will tell misleading findings. And the third is sometimes they tell what's in the data, but not necessarily what isn't in the data. And I can certainly go into those three points. We've got great examples of organizations that we've had conversations with around those, those areas. You know, around the, the dashboards can't filter out nonsense or noise from the data. You know, I think we use the phrase a lot that win-loss is a garbage in, garbage out exercise. There needs to be you know, careful curation and vetting of information in the program. Otherwise, information is going to be 
kind of unreliable at best and misleading at worst. You know, and, and a great example of that is we re- recently had a company that reached out to Innova to discuss partnering on a more robust win-loss engagement. They were doing a version of win-loss that is less based on feedback from customers and more data mining their CRM data. So they were trying to determine things like win rates by region and deal size and product types, all stuff that tries to answer what is happening, but maybe falls short of why or how. And so anyway, the client came to us and you know they had this huge report, almost 50 slides of data that was recently presented to their exec team. And they were talking about how their win rate is X in North America, Y in EMEA, and how that's changing compared to 2020 and 2021. So obviously, you know, on the surface, really great information. They also shared with us kind of the underlying data, uh, which was a simple export from their CRM. It had over 9,000 rows of details around deals that were closed out over the previous few years. And despite, uh, you know, all of that data, it took about three and a half minutes of us starting to click through and scrolling through the data to realize that the whole report that was prepared and presented to the executive team it was essentially garbage. Uh, the first 20 rows of that spreadsheet, all of the deals all said things like duplicate deal or incorrect contact. And you know that's the danger of just relying on unvetted data. You might be able to find some great insight that your win rate in North America and deals over 200K for your ABC product line is dropping, but that might just be because there were five separate instances of the same mm-hmm. loss situation being included in the analysis. So relying solely on dashboards or even a type of win-loss that is more curated or defined by CRM data mining can certainly be dangerous for, you know, the findings that bubble up from it. Um, and you guys can't see this, but there was a little tear, a tear in Will's eye when we were talking about bad data in there. So yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm the one has to come through it and check right? it. So. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> yeah. The misleading nature of sometimes these static reports also comes through. One, we actually do, you know, the forensic exercise of conducting interviews and capturing the feedback from your prospects and customers. You know, I think everyone wants simple. They want that silver bullet metric or answer to a question. But we really think it's important to go beyond those high level stats to truly understand what's going on. You know, a great example of that is we did this study recently where Will was talking about an example where a sales team was being praised a lot. Uh, This is another example like that. You know, we were seeing that this client's sales team effectiveness, it was being cited as a strength by nearly 80% of all their respondents, including their losses. But then when we looked at some of the quantitative metrics, you know, the sales team, it was consistently scoring less than the competing sales team. And so, you know, what seems like a simple question, is our client sales team good or is it not? That was actually pretty confusing initially because qualitatively, it appears they're strong, quantitatively, they're not. And what we discovered was that when we went into that 80% number and started double clicking into the actual quotes, we learned that almost three quarters of those mentions were technically strengths, but they were for things like responding to prospect inquiries quickly. And while it's nice that the sales team is responsive, if that's the best thing that a customer has to say about a sales team, that isn't really necessarily indicative of a high-performing, rain-making sales team. And so by adjusting that 80% number down, we were able to help that client see past the high-level finding, which is that their sales team is a strength. And we were really able to have a focused, productive conversation about how to build up the sales team skills so that they can be praised for higher level things like being able to differentiate and giving a tailored presentation. And then, you know, the the third way that dashboards or static reports can kind of be misleading is they tell what's in the data, but not necessarily what isn't. And that requires interpreting the interpreting the data really in kind of a, a next level thinking kind of fashion. So you know, we have a client in the, the travel and hospitality space who worked with for a long time. And in a most recent report for them, we were giving an overview of findings. And, you know, there were things like their mobile app, which was strong and things around their sales team and their service execution that could be improved. But there was actually something that wasn't in the data that was the biggest finding that the stakeholders really gravitated towards. So in years past, you know, pre-pandemic, Things like the company's reporting and analytic functionality and their high-touch service model were being consistently cited as strengths. But now, you know, post-pandemic, those things, it's not that they were necessarily coming up more as a weakness. It's that they had totally disappeared as strengths. 
And what had happened was that their competitive differentiators had, had disappeared, in part because during the pandemic, some of their competitors had used the downturn in travel to really heavily invest in their own technology platforms, while our client had stayed stagnant and, in fact, had to reduce their service team headcount because of that downturn. And so by being able to identify not what was in the data, but by wasn't in the data, again, you know, their traditional competitive differentiators no longer existing, we were really able to lead a strategic conversation with their C-level executives about you know, how their competitive position had eroded and what they could do about it moving forward. And you know, if we hadn't gone beyond the data, we probably would have just had a conversation around how people like their mobile app. Hmm. Powerful. All right. So, and then, oh, go ahead. Oh, and you know, if we have time, the, the last thing around going beyond the data that we wanted to talk about was just the importance of bringing together cross-functional groups. Absolutely. Um, and you know, I talked about how important that is at the beginning of the program. It's also really important at the end of the program because discussion and internal alignment is so paramount in order for organizations to move forward and act on the feedback. And you know, I think the important thing to keep in mind for you know the organizations that are either thinking about putting a program in place or or have one currently is that everyone has different perspectives and, and different viewpoints. You know, we often see that you know, negative product feedback isn't actually about the product. Uh, if someone gives feedback that is talking about our client missing a certain capability, it certainly may be because that feature doesn't exist. But, you know, a lot of times the prospect is actually wrong. And it's because they are saying the, the feature doesn't exist. But that's because the sales team wasn't memorable enough when talking about that feature. It didn't resonate with the product or the prospect, I should say. Or, the, or, they, or, or the, they just didn't bring it up at all. Uh, we've exactly. certainly had situations where we're reading out a report and we're kind of going through a list of things that were called out specifically about the product that were missing or lagging. And, you know, people in that meeting will be like, well, we do offer that. So we clearly need to do a better job of selling it. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you really need to try to get to the root cause of why that feedback exists in the first place. And that's why it's so important to have different stakeholders from throughout the business. You know, the root cause for saying feature X doesn't exist, it may be because the sales team member, maybe they just forgot. They had a lot on their plate and they didn't touch on it. That happens. But they also might not have known that it was actually important for the prospect. So that's something related to their needs assessment that they need to work on. It also could be because the sales team member isn't knowledgeable enough about the product, so they need to improve their product knowledge. Or they might know about it, but maybe they aren't confident enough to really be talking about a new capability that just rolled out. And so that could be a sales enablement issue. It also could be a marketing issue. Maybe the marketing materials around that functionality need to be strengthened and make it easier for the marketplace to understand how an organization really competes on that feature. And so in order to get everyone on the same page, product, sales, marketing, sales enablement, you really need to build an assembly of minds to really absorb what the feedback is saying and discuss why that feedback exists in the first place and really uncover that root cause to, in order to effectively address it. And, and, and I think, okay. yeah, not to sound like a broken record here, but these meetings really truly are my favorite part of the job, getting to sit in with those C-suite level executives and kind of tell them what's going on with with their business based on their customers' perceptions, give them some recommendations. And it's not only a cool opportunity for me, but in a lot of our programs, we get the chance to kind of elevate, you know, the product managers we're working with. And we, we put them in the room with the C-suite level executives as well, where they might not get a chance to have a conversation with those people. So it's not only exciting for, for me, but, but also some of the, the people we work with on a day-to-day -day basis as well. And I think for the sponsor of the project, it's an important step, right? It's not just so that the C-level understands, but then so that you can create sort of an action plan out of that so that it goes from, yes, I understand it to, and now here's how we're going to address it. And that's really where when they come back in six months or a year, they're really going to see the value in the program because they not only have a better understanding, but they had a, a plan and with this cross-functional approach buy-in in order to make that plan a reality. Yeah, exactly. Really well said. All right. We talked a lot about a lot of different things. So if we could do have our listeners do two things differently tomorrow based on what we talked about today, what would it be? And why don't we each do one? Well, you want to lead it off? Two things that they could do differently tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Well, shamelessly do work with us and, and see what your customers are <laughs> see what your customers are saying. 
I don't know. Well, what do you think? Yeah, I, think the, I think the two things that we really want to make sure your listeners appreciate is take the, the necessary steps and put in the work up front to make sure that the program is aligned to their strategic initiatives. And then don't just rely on the data coming in. Push yourself to go beyond the data to really right. unlock truths about your organization that you can act on and, and use it to compete more effectively, win more business moving forward, put in the work on the front end and the back end. Uh, you know, like anything in life, there are no shortcuts. You can try to automate things, but and you can certainly become more efficient at things, but really putting in the effort to maximize the value from the program will just pay dividends in terms of the ability to leverage the program to help you win more moving forward. Yeah, it's it's worth the extra effort to make sure you're not putting garbage in and, and getting garbage out. You, it's worth the extra effort to ensure you're actually getting insights that are aligning with your strategic initiatives and, and things that are ultimately going to drive change and help you win more business. Excellent. All right. And I know you've talked a little bit about this, but you have lots of good thoughts, lots of good help, lots of good tools on this topic. We will post in the description links to the articles, Will, that you've done that we've posted. But where else would you encourage people to come hear some really great advice about win-loss? Yeah, great question. So Anova publishes a lot of thought leadership on our website. We've got great blogs that can help people understand best practices around doing win-loss. We have really interesting case studies so you can learn how different companies approach their programs to unlock the insights that are most relevant to their business. We host webinars on an ongoing basis that really serve as kind of a, an introduction to win-loss as well as other types of research like churn analysis or client experience analysis. So there's a lot of great learnings that you can get from the Innova website. And, and also, you know, we, we love partnering with organizations like Pragmatic because you have a lot of great resources on your website as well. Excellent. Well, thank you, Zach. Thank you, Will. Uh, it was a really great conversation and I appreciate your guys' time and your expertise. Yeah, this was really fun, Rebecca. We, uh, we appreciate the time and, um, you know, to everyone listening, hopefully we shared some ideas and, and examples so that you can optimize your own win-loss program at, at your organization. Yeah, thank you so much, Rebecca. I really enjoyed the conversation. Awesome. All right. That does it for today's episode. Thank you everyone for listening. And don't forget to join us next week when we tackle another great topic designed to help you elevate your product, your company, and your career. <laughs>